Hello, everyone. Hey, congratulations on your new movie, Bolt from the Blue. Thank Hi. you. Thank you so much, Gary. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, for speaking to us, especially the fact that your film is coming out uh, really soon this weekend at the Austin Film Festival. How, how, do, how do you folks feel about this? So excited. I'm excited. I'm from San Antonio originally, so for it to premiere, world premiere in Texas is very exciting for me. <laughs> It's been two years in the making, you know, it, it's hard to believe that we shot this thing two years ago. So to finally have a, a congregation sitting inside a theater with you and, and seeing how they react to it, it's it's sure to be an exhilarating experience. Yeah, and luckily Austin is such an incredible film hub in this country uh, and such an amazing city, but amazing people who actually really love and appreciate film and uh, to be able to have our world premiere at the Stateside Theater is a huge, huge honor. Most excellent. Well, Jack, I'm going to throw you the first question is uh, where the original idea came from um, for your film, Bolt from the Blue? So funny enough, it was actually a short film idea that I had 10, 10 years ago. Uh, and I had always written it for my brother, Kevin. Uh, and uh, funny enough, it was like this big adventure short film. I was like, I'm never going to get the money or the resources to shoot this. And it, I just kind of tabled it and put it to the side. Uh, and then uh, three years ago, my producer, Mike, and I met up and we said, all right, let's make a movie. How about in Alaska? Because that's where Mike is from. And I basically picked out uh, Bolt from the Blue, basically, you know, from the, from the drawer. I never thought I would ever pick up the story again. And I had always written it around uh, Lightning Valley, which was originally in uh, Colorado. And I, I basically termed that from Lightning Alley, which is a real place in Florida. That is actually like the most amount of lightning strikes hit this you know, uh, a few miles stretch in Florida. Um, and it's the most amount of lightning strikes that hit the, the Earth's surface, essentially, in the entire world. And I was like, well, mountains look a little bit cooler on camera. So change Lightning Alley to Lightning Valley. Uh, and then my producer, Mike, is actually from Alaska. So he said, why don't we shoot up there? Uh, you know, we'll be in the middle of nowhere, so no one will bother us. And we can get away with some cool stuff. And we can maybe get some boats and planes and uh, beautiful mountains in the distance and uh, incredible cabins uh, and just a bunch of amazing people up in Alaska as well who uh, basically pitched in and helped out. So, uh, yeah. And then uh, basically trying to transfer it from a short film into a feature was trying to uh, it was all about finding something deeper uh, with the meaning behind capturing the the Super Bolt. And so that's where I decided to explore more about climate change, not only the issues, but more the solutions of it all. And uh, through my research, just reading up about essentially thousands of incredible scientists and engineers around the world who are way smarter than me, uh, yet just as passionate about what they're doing. And they wake up every day, um, you know, with this greater mission. I was just really inspired by that. And I just wanted to kind of share that sense of hope uh, and drive and, and determination to essentially create a brighter and greener f future. I, you know, for me, I wanted to share that. And that was through this movie. Wow, most excellent. Uh, Kevin Page, could you uh, tell us what initially drew you uh, to this project? I guess for Kevin, th this is technically written for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, Jack and I grew up making movies, and our middle brother would help us produce them. And we had been talking for years. When are we going to finally we team up? Because when I did a series on TNT and Jack was coming out of USC, he kind of paved his own way. I paved mine. And it was the middle brother who said, when are we going to team back up? When are we going to do something together again? And it was this movie. We just didn't know when Jack was going to be ready to, to create it. And so it turned out to be one of the best experiences I've had and by far the top experience as a performer. So I'm excited for everyone to see it. Paige, what drew you here? Yeah, so um, Kevin is, we were engaged at the time, and I knew that Jack was writing, some had been writing, working on this script. Um, you know, I'm a very superstitious person, and I'm kind of like, I knew, you know, he had spoken to me about the character and that he was, you know, thinks that it would, it would, uh, I would be great in the role. And, you know, maybe I could read it and maybe read, you know, do something for them and, and see how it worked out together. And, I read the script and I was like, fell in love with Mia. And so um, 
I was so excited and hopeful that they would like what I what I could bring to her. And they did. And so I got the role and I was really excited. Um, and then finding out, you know, later I, I got it first and then Kevin was a little bit later on. So when I found out that Kevin was going to be opposite me, I was just thrilled because, you know, we, we got married a week before we started shooting in Alaska. So this was sort of our pseudo honeymoon. Yeah. Uh, so that it was just that was an incredible experience in and of itself. But no, I was very excited when Jack first approached me about it. Wow. So so it's easily um, to conclude that there were instant chemistry between <laughs> you two. <laughs> uh, for, for yes. The yes, I would. I, I would like to think so. I think their their middle brother said, how awkward would it be if we watched this? And we were like, wow, no chemistry there. Right. But luckily, I don't think that was the case. I think it came across really, really incredibly. And, you know, it was we had so much fun together. Wow. Um, Jack, uh, tell tell us about how real the science is um, for your film. I mean, uh, after all, it is technically a fictional film. It is, but there is a lot of concrete science in there, actually. Um, a lot of the jargon that Paige, at least, uh, throws around as Mia is rooted in science. I had to reach out to a couple friends who, uh, like I had one friend who was an aeronautical engineer, uh, and I would say, hey, can you just like throw me a few sentences of stuff? And like I, I would like send him something and he'd be like, OK, well, that doesn't really make sense. Um, you know, and even like, you know, there's that bit with like the TV and then uh, or the phone, the TV and then the toaster. And, you know, I don't want to give too much away, but I think I had them in a different order. And somebody pointed out they're like, actually, no, the toaster is what draws the most energy compared to a TV. And I, I was shocked by that. I was like, really? And he was like, yeah. So uh, I did try to uh, root it as much as I could in real science, just because, you know, for me, I personally don't care about that. But I, at the same time, I care if the audience cares. And there are definitely people there who, you know, that'll pull them out of the movie if they're like, wait a second, that's like basic science. And they didn't even, you know, tap into that. Um, yeah. And in regards to Lucas, Lucas is more like me. And Half of his stuff is just kind of random, but that's the fun of it. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, did you did you feel like you're you were playing your brother Jack? Yeah, I think it's sort of a hybrid between who Jack is now and who I was growing up. I mean, Jack had a front row seat to all my quirky mannerisms and my growth as an actor from my early teenage years. And so it's pretty easy to plug into it. But you know, I've talked about this numerous times in interviews. You know, I pride myself on having a pretty long career as an actor, but it was the only time where at the end of every day of shooting, I'd look at Jack and I'd be like, is this what you're looking for? And I remember when we wrapped the movie, I looked at Paige when we were flying back to LA and I go, this is either going to be the best performance I've given of my career, or it's just not going to fit together and it's going to be completely incompatible compared to what I wanted to do. And Jack had me over a year and a half ago to watch a first cut of the movie. And it was just he and I watching. And by the end, I was like, glad I listened to you because that is the best performance I've ever given of my life. So it was fun. And Paige, did you even know what you were talking about uh, in this film? <laughs> I did not know the, 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 the uh, jargon that I was using that <laughs> Jack was speaking of. I with it but I have three engineer cousins so at one point or another I reached out to one of one or two of them and was like is this like what how should I be saying this because I feel silly saying it I don't know what I'm saying and they're like no it's perfect that sounds perfectly good you know you you gotta just say it like you mean it and so yeah so I did and they tried to explain a little bit to me but I don't do so well with numbers so <laughs> um so that that was just that was interesting to me, honestly, when they, they did explain uh, some of it to me. And now it's kind of like it's left my, my brain, but it was cool in the moment. And yeah, they, that was very helpful, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, uh, tell us about the props you used uh, in this film. Did you guys just make it all up? And um, and what did you really do to the car? <laughs> yeah, Sparky. Um, yeah, so uh, I actually spent probably a good month or two building the props the beacon shooter and stuff like that and i would send photos to my team uh you know because when you're when you you don't have a whole lot of money and resources you have to wear a lot of hats and so uh yeah like for instance the the original beacon shooter i was like all right i think it'd be really funny if he just has something that looks kind of like a cool t-shirt cannon 
Uh, but the end beacon shooter that, you know, he redesigns, uh, that is actually a Nerf gun. I looked through so many Nerf guns and then found one that I was like, I haven't really seen that one before. And it uh, extends. And then I like cut parts of it to make it its own shape. But then I also went to random like junkyards and stuff like that. And all the attachments on on top of most of the props is really just junk. It's, you know, kind of the Star Wars mentality that uh, George Lucas had with um, A New Hope is a lot of the stuff, like a lot of the costumes and stuff like that is just stuff that he could find for cheap or no money and paint to look metallic and heavy and actually legit. Um, and so that was a lot of fun. I wanted to make something, uh, essentially I wanted to make something that you would see in a video game, in a modern video game where a kid would look at me like, I've never seen that before and I want it, you know? Um, and then Sparky, oh man, Sparky, she's such a character. Um, a lot of the stuff on the roof is a bunch of random junk as well um, that was spray painted. Uh, that white thing on the back is actually an ice cream maker it's an ice cream machine um and the great thing about it is like sparky and the props and you know that fine line of is lucas actually real is uh, you know is anything that he believes or is he's saying is that actual real science or is this all just made up stuff i wanted it to kind of feel like how i felt when i was 10 years old running around in my backyard with kevin and we would just use anything as props and we would just kind of create this world ourselves because lucas is kind of just this big man child he never fully grew up um and that's you know that's kind of the spirit of of sparky where it's like is this a doppler radar or is this actually just a screensaver like you're not really <laughs> sure at any point um but that's kind of the the fun quirk of sparky and uh yeah and, and then when we were even sound designing it too it was a big thing of trying to uh make it like multiple different things because it's got like a bit of a hydrogen en engine a bit of a, a natural oil engine and then it's also electric so we had to like fluctuate through all those different sounds you can't really put your finger on it and uh it, it was also stick shift so it's actually kind of hard to drive uh you know it's been through 20 Alaskan winters um, and really roughed up off-roading. I think it died probably, no joke, I'm not over-exaggerating, I think two dozen times. And we shot over the course of three weeks. Like literally every other day, we had to grab our gaffer, uh, Matt, and we'd be like, Sparky died again. And we have to pull the van. Sparky's gone. Sparky is not working right now. <laughs> yeah, it happened so many times. And I was just like, oh my God. And I was like, I was just waiting for the one time where it she didn't start back up um but she did but every morning typically when the frost came in and it was super cold we we would have to spend a good 10 minutes getting sparky up and running again most excellent well let, let me uh let me wrap it up with one last question because it was bugging me why the vhs camera <laughs> so funny that you're you're not the first person to ask that question um what's funny about that is we actually spent a lot of time going through Clem's back background, like why he dresses the way he dresses, you know, where does he go when he leaves? Like what's his home life? And I like to imagine that Clem doesn't come from much money. He lives with his grandma. Uh, hence some of his clothes. Like I like the idea that Clem is literally dressed up by his grandma in some ways. And, uh, and I love the idea that he was just going through like a goodwill shop because, you know, on the small Island, they don't have a lot of resources or anything like that. And he saw, oh, sweet, like there's this VHS camera for like a killer price. Um, and he probably even like tried to haggle it down a little bit, being like, hey, I'll, I'll, like, I'll take out your trash for two weeks, like anything. I want this camera. And I think I, I love the idea that he saw that VHS camera and he was like, ah, oh, this is what will, you know, prove to the world that I'm an auteur. Like mm -hmm. it's got that film grain to it. It's got texture. Like everybody's on TikTok and Instagram and all that stuff shooting on their phones. And there's no like filmic quality to that. And naturally most people would be like, yeah, film cameras are cool. And Clem's like, no, VHS. That's, that was peak film, which I think also is just funny because that's ironic as hell. Nobody really thinks that. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> most excellent well i do i do uh I, i'm out of time but uh but this is a very fun movie i you know so you you guys are such a great family affair trying to capture you know lightning in a bottle per se so uh hopefully uh, all you guys have a you know work work together uh in the, in the future once again and thank thank you for dealing with my co-host at the beginning of this uh interview no, I love a good kitty. Thank, Thank you so much. You.